On the subject of carb cycling, there is one truth that is absolutely certain, and that is that people have very strong opinions about the topic. I'm here today to say that I don't really care what your opinions might be. We're gonna talk about the facts of carb cycling, what it has utility for, what it's not useful for, when situationally you might want to use it, and what situations it's just simply not appropriate for at all. So we're gonna dive into all that in granular detail here. This is episode number 267 of The Drop Set. Let's hit it. Hello, everybody, and welcome. Darren Starr here. Thank you for joining me. This is, in fact, episode 267 of The Drop Set. Uh, for those watching on YouTube, thank you. Welcome once again. Feel free to, uh, you know what, give it 10 minutes. And if you still like the video at that point, then you can actually push the button. Don't do it just yet because you might do it preemptively. And then you're like, man, this guy is what the heck. And now I've messed up your algorithm and everything's just a shit show. We don't want that. And similarly, hold off on the subscribe. The last thing I want you to do is subscribe to the channel because you see this video and then like the next one that comes out, you're like, oh, this is stupid. And now you regret subscribing. And then I see my subscriber dro account drop by one, which is horrific and depressing. So don't do that to me. Just hold off. Hold off. It's a commitment, right? I want to make sure that we're good for each other here. Uh, if you're listening in audio only land, by the way, hey, thanks for joining me. We've already been at it for a bit. So um, today we're going to talk carb cycling here. Uh, by the way, oh yeah, all the usual stuff, uh, social media, Instagram, Darren underscore star at the drop set podcast as well. TikTok at Darren underscore star. Um, yeah, and, and I'm not going to lie. You'll see the same thing on both of those platforms. So one or the other, take your pick, whatever you do. Uh, you, it's, it's not like I'm doing different. I'm one person. I don't have time to do all that stuff on different different stuff on different platforms, right? I'm a human being. I'm one guy. Like, cut me some slack here. Um, anyway, t today, <laughs> reset. When, when are we going on air, by the way? So let's start by um, defining what a carb cycle actually is. It's, it's very simple. It's just when you have different carb targets for different days, depending on what the day is or what's happening on that day. There's cases to be made for and against this. There's some practical ways that we can implement it. And then there are some variations on this as well. So we'll dive into all that stuff here as we get rolling. Um, the reasoning behind all this stuff, just from a very conceptual um, perspective, uh, the idea here basically is that you increase your intake or you lower your intake to more closely be in line with your activity or your output. So basically, on days when you're expending a lot of calories, we're going to take more in. On days when you're expending fewer calories, we're going to take fewer in. It's just kind of a matchy-matchy situation there. Um, so what that does is it just makes it easier to scale your degree of difficulty when you're in a deficit. So you might be thinking or having this, this sense of dread hanging over you like, oh no, it's a low carb day. Well, yeah, but you're not training on this day. So you have less need for carbs. So I think mentally it doesn't necessarily make you feel any better just because mentally you always want to eat more. Right. Um, but from a physical, you know, biomechanical perspective, like, yeah, it, it does make sense. And it, it, um, it, it can be something that does make it feel more sustainable over time. And that's a word that you're going to get sick of hearing me say over the course of this podcast. So what it does is it, uh, if we carb cycle in a way where we just bring your carbs down on your rest days, it lowers your average daily intake without it having that impact all of the days. So it's kind of a way to you know cheat or game the system a little bit. Uh, how we do it. So again, we're, we're looking to reduce the average daily win t intake um, or your weekly intake, as it were. And it's most easily, I mean, it's just easier to modulate this if you look at things in, um, in chunks that are week long. Now, it's not just a carb cycling thing. I'd say the, the thing that this comes, <laughs> this, this little point here that really just wiggles away in my brain endlessly is it comes most up uh, comes up most often when talking about split design like how do we construct a split to really be as effective as we want it to be inside the confines of a seven day week simply because that's like the most repeatable way to do things and i just wish we didn't have a seven day week i wish it was broken into like something that's not a prime number six day week would be great eight would be great even nine would be good because then you get three chunks of three Instead, with seven days, you get like a three, a two, and a two, or a three and a four, or a three and a three and a one. It's like, it's just a pain in the ass to divide things into a seven day week. This is not just a bodybuilding thing. This is just an overall, like, why did humans design our calendar like this? And yes, I understand it has to do with sun rotation around blah, 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 blah. And it's the Babylonians' fault, right? So apparently, this goes back to around 2000, 2300 BC, something like that. 
when they first conceptualized a seven day week. So um, it's the Babylonians fault. We're going to place it all on them. So now you can follow an absolute schedule for this, like Sunday and Thursday are my low days um, or a relative schedule, which is to say it's flexible. And you might say rest days are my low days. Of course, that that is more preferred because <laughs> Sunday and Thursday being your rest days. OK, well, what if Sunday and Thursday, one of those or both happens to be a leg day? You're doing low, uh, low carbs on your higher output days of the week. Mm, no, thanks. Not a good not a good idea. So um, there's definitely some smarter ways to do this and there's some dumb ways to do it. Um, and what I want to do is get into like, should we do it at all? And if we should, when should we? Why should we? What should we expect from it? So let's talk about the pros. So the pros of carb cycling are that it helps keep your training performance high. And clearly we're, we're mostly talking like in a deficit is when carb cycling really kind of, you know, as much as it shines uh, ever, that's when it does. So now your performance may still suffer some, but if you carb cycle and you keep your intake higher on training days, it will suffer less than if your intake is just lower on all days. Um, so, and that's just due to, you know, we're, we're pulling back on carbs a little bit on days when we don't really need it. You're eating less, but not on all days. Um, now in a growth phase, if you're going to carb cycle, there can be some utility here. Um, it can help reduce body fat gain a little bit. So if you're not eating in a surplus or at least maybe a less aggressive surplus on days when you're not training, you know, you don't need all that gas in the tank necessarily. So let's just not overfill it. Um, now the caveat there is that if you have those extra calories on your rest days, that may still add, that may still aid in growth um, because you're growing on those days when you're out of the gym. So um, it's like, do we want to eat more to fuel performance or to fuel growth or both? I don't really have a strong opinion on that. I'd say it's situational. I would, uh, you know, when I work with um, clients who are in a growth phase and I feel like there's some benefit in modulating things, if I have somebody who does tend to put on body fat a little bit faster than the average person, I think pulling back their their intake just because if, you know, if we have a 400 calorie swing um, in input for, for a training day versus a low day, if we eliminate that, then over the course of, you know, a handful of weeks, we're going to put on an extra pound of body fat that we don't need. So, um, and that's just one way. And that's just through that excess, just from non-training days. So if we pull back on that, it just keeps us kind of in a realm where things stay a little bit tighter longer. So, um, and when calories are high, also, if you have a low day periodically, which doesn't have to be a tragically low day, just a little bit lower, um, it gives your digestive system a little bit of a break too. Uh, your digestive system can really struggle to keep up with processing all the food that you're trying to throw into it um, once your calories get high enough. And so just pulling back a little bit, and I've certainly worked with clients every now and then where we'll actually like do a 24 hour fast if it really gets to a point where things are so, so overdone where it's like, dude, I just don't even want to think about food anymore. Okay, cool. Well, it's not for a day and it's a mental break. It's a physical digestive break as well. And that can extend a growth phase that kind of looks like we might be approaching a brick wall. We can get another several weeks, a month or two months out of it at that point. So, and when you get people who are working, you know, at the extreme ends of bodybuilding, like you're going to have to do some stuff like this every night, you're going to have to push the envelopes. You're going to have to be uncomfortable. And so carb cycling is a way that we can kind of mitigate some of that discomfort in some situations too. So the cons of carb cycling, well, the big thing here is it can overcomplicate things if you don't need to. I've worked with plenty of clients who are like, do I really have to do this? And my answer is typically like, yeah. And if we don't, great, try it. And I know what I'm going to hear from you in a couple of weeks. I'm just trying to get ahead of that. So again, it's about um, making things feel more sustainable. And why wait until they feel unsustainable before implementing it, especially if we kind of know it's going to happen. It just makes sense, right? It's just a smart move. So if you're a beginning lifter, um, you're not going to notice the benefit of having more carbs on your training days realistically, or you're less likely to realize the benefit of that. Um, and you're less likely to uh, realize the benefit of taking in fewer on your rest days as well. Um, and, you know, some some beginners, certainly they have like a heightened sense of body awareness. I would say that's not typical. That's something that that most people learn over the course of their lifting career. As their experience grows, their body awareness grows, and you become more acutely aware of those changes in energy needs and like recovery ability and that kind of stuff. Um, it's one more thing to track. It's one more thing to be mindful of. It's one more thing you can mess up. Um, so a lot of people just, uh, if especially if they are following a macro-based diet where they build the plan themselves. Um, they don't necessarily do it in a smart enough way where if there is, um, you know, if they lift later in the day, for example, they may eat 
in preparation for a lifting day and then something happens and then they don't end up lifting, but now they've overeaten to their target for the day, which there are very simple and obvious ways around that, which is to say like, keep all of those changes in your pre and post workout meal, not in a meal that's, you know, hours and hours and hours before you lift. Um, that's kind of obvious, but it, it eludes a lot of people nonetheless. Um, and also I would say, you know, if, if we're carb cycling, I would say you want to get to a point where if you plan to lift, you just lift. It's not one of those things where it's like, Oh, something happens and I didn't lift. And that, you know, um, that happens like on a weekly basis. Like if that happens as a one-off here and there, I get it, but it should be pretty rare. Um, so just a gut check on that. Just, and this is like an overall, like, hey, am I progressing the way that I should in my bodybuilding adventures kind of gut check here? If you schedule a lift and then don't do it, you got a problem. Again, if it's a one-off here and there, but a one-off should be like, you know, I got stuck at work and they wouldn't let me leave or somebody was in the hospital or something like that. Oftentimes what I hear from clients is, oh, I got busy and it didn't happen. Don't want to hear that. Don't want to hear that. So don't put yourself in that category. Um, this is kind of an overarching thing. We're off topic here, but surprise, surprise, it's me. As far as expectations of results, you know, what you put in versus what you expect to get out, the more you make all of this bodybuilding stuff a priority where it's less interruptible and it's more rock solid and it's just baked into the formula of your life, the more successful you will be with it. And if you have ambitious goals, that are going to take some work to achieve. You just need to be aware, like that's the level of commitment that it takes, where if somebody suggests a scenario where you might skip a workout, you just laugh at them. Like, yeah, no, that's not going to happen. I mean, it's kind of a, kind of a meme and kind of dumb. And, you know, you can certainly get, you just annoyingly overcommitted. Um, but at the same time, if you want to be successful, that's kind of what it takes. So just good to have that little reality check. Um, other cons of carb cycling here. Low days can sometimes get too low and that can lead to behavior that borders on binging or wanting to or feeling the need to. So there's this bend, don't break mentality here. And again, it's we're matching your intake with your expenditure. So we're taking in less because you need less. But there gets to be a point where it's just once your calories are below a certain absolute number, you just hyper fixate on it. And then if you end up breaking and having some kind of food related binge, it's not good. It's not good. So that, that is a downside. And that's one thing that I'm always checking with clients is just making sure like, hey, how are we feeling here? You, you good with this? And don't put on a brave face for me. Like, be honest about it. Like, if you feel like, well, I'm kind of white knuckling it through these days. Like, mm, okay, all right. Maybe we should scale back, you know, take a, a break from it for a week. Um, but not like, okay, cool. Let's push it a little harder then. Like, no, that's, that's bad coaching right there. Um, Introduction of high days, not appropriate for all people. This is, has to do with training intensity. So sometimes we want to focus on really trying to drive, um, you know, uh, additional performance, additional growth in certain areas that, um, that need it. And one way that you can do that is to push higher calories on those training days. Not always necessarily the best strategy. It can be a good strategy. Absolutely. I've certainly done that myself on leg days a lot. And I've certainly, you know, the thing is like, you've got to be able to deliver. If you're having a high carb day and you go and you're like, yeah, that was an okay workout. I'm like, yeah, that doesn't, that didn't work. Like if we're having a high carb day, we need to be guaranteed that it's going to be a gangbuster of a workout. Like it's going to be off the chain. So um, that's kind of an expectation. So there is some pressure involved there as well. And that's just has to do with the skill of training. So not really for beginners. I would really say not really for intermediates either. Like you got to be advanced where you just know you're going to walk in and you're going to crush it every single day when you've got a high carb day on the books. So execution of a carb cycle. We're going to keep the math here fairly simple. So let's pretend that we have 200 grams of carbs per day on our fictitious diet. So 1400 grams per week. And we're training five days a week. And one of those is a leg day. Does that matter? I don't know. We'll see. So our training experience is intermediate, right? And we're in a deficit right now. So I've set the stage for you. That's where we're at. If we carb cycle, you know, I would advocate for kind of keeping it to be a fairly modest swing between um, the higher and the lower days, simply due to training experience. You know, we're intermediate. We're not like, you know, setting the gym on fire every time we're in there. That could benefit from like keeping your calories up a little bit higher and then pulling them down more sharply on your non-training days. Also, if you're an experienced lifter, I'm also going to make the assumption that you're an experienced dieter and you're going to be more likely to just be able to hang with a super low calorie day if it comes 
comes to it. So there's a little bit of correlation cause and effect that comes there as well. So um, basically what it comes down to, it's kind of like, you know, with your training split, one thing, one way that you could describe a training split is just, there's only so much volume you can recover from in the course of a week. How do you want to split that amongst all the body parts that you need to work? So here it's like, well, we have 1,400 grams of carbs per the, for the week. How do we want to split those out amongst our days? And so uh, in the, I gave four examples here where we're just doing training days and non-training days. We're not adding in an additional high day. So that one leg day per week, we're not making that a special case under this scenario here. So the first example, or actually the last one on the list here, is just all days are at 200 grams. That's kind of what we said before. So that's not a carb cycle. That's just saying, well, that's our baseline here. So... Um, the most extreme example is you could take in an extra 50 grams of carbs per day on your training days if you pull your rest days down to 75. So if somebody is a more advanced lifter, this is an avenue that I might recommend. Again, the, the assumption there being that they're more of an advanced dieter, and I trust that they're going to be able to hang in through a 75-gram carb day. I know some people watching this are like, 75 grams, ha, that's a ton. And some people are like, 75 grams of carbs isn't even a meal. Um, both of you are correct. Everything is relative, so just chill out, all right? Uh, the next example would be, well, you could bump up your carbs daily from 200 to 225. Then we do have to pull them down on rest days, but down to 140. It's, it's not quite as extreme. Or if you just gave yourself a modest bump from 200 up to 215, then you're only pulling your non-training days down to 160. So that gives you a 55 gram differential, which is something. It's not much of a boost, but it's not much of a drop for those two days either. That's really like the introduction to carb cycling. And that might be what I would recommend realistically. So those, those are kind of rounded numbers you see if you do the math here that doesn't quite add up correctly but it's close enough that's about where we where we'd end up here so those are all ways that it can work that a carb cycle can work on a conceptual level as far as execution is concerned now there is something that we should uh, note here that's very very important and this is where people kind of get over their skis a little bit on carb cycling all of the options in that previous slide are going to get you the same results in terms of fat loss so Here's the thing that's going to make some people upset, um, but I'm sorry, it is the truth. And if you don't like it, then you don't like science. So chill out. Um, carb cycling is not a fat loss strategy. Carb cycling does not accelerate fat loss. It's a sustainability and tolerability strategy. So what you're looking to do is take your weekly carb allowance, which in a deficit does generally have to be reduced over time, and you are modulating your volume so it's lower on some days higher on some days to make it more tolerable and more sustainable and and to keep your performance higher none of this let me repeat this again slower for emphasis here none of this has anything to do with fat loss except for the fact that you know we're in a deficit so we're focusing on fat loss but we don't carb cycle because we want better results in terms of fat loss we carb cycle because we want a more sustainable plan from week to week that's just easier to follow and feels less horrible basically so it's basically a pain mitigation strategy is what it comes down to. So um, can you tolerate very low days for the sake of more carbs on training days? That's one question worth asking. Does your performance improve when you do that? So if you carb cycle aggressively and you don't really notice a change in your performance, is there really any benefit from it? No, not really. Like that's the idea. That's the idea here. So, um, and the ratio is something that's definitely worth experimenting with. So now I know uh, most of the people who would argue that this is a fat loss strategy are going to make the argument about leptin. So let's just address that right now. This is the leptin myth. By the way, in, in researching this podcast, I just wanted to go through and like, what am I forgetting here? And so, you know, I watched a bunch of videos and read a bunch of comments from people on those videos. And let me tell you, people out there have some opinions on this stuff. And it's kind of like, you know, it, it's kind of embarrassing almost in a way, like how passionate fe people feel about carb cycling, like feel passionate about like pollution or like ending hunger or something like that. But it, 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 it's fucking food and it's just dividing out the way that you eat food over the course of a week. Like there's plenty of other things in the world to be more passionate about, especially considering like regardless of how you feel about it, the science has pretty much decided on this. Like, <laughs> I mean, there may still be things that we learned, but a lot of what people hold is like, this is what I believe. It's like, this has been disproven long ago. Stop it. 
Stop it. So um, as it says here on the slide, some people need to chill out. Yeah, you really do. So it's not a fat loss strategy. But then if people say, well, this worked for me, you know, blah, blah, blah. And what it means is that you are successful, however we're defining that, and like, you know, your fat loss phase in leaning out, you are successful, but carb cycling wasn't the reason for that unless the lack of sustainability in a plan is why you failed before. So again, the carb cycling isn't doing anything magical, magical like, oh, because I have high days and low days, it stokes my metabolism and therefore I'm burning more fat. That is all complete and total unequivocal bullshit that is not true. Like you might believe it's true. And if you do, it's not. And I'm sorry. And at this point, you've probably clicked off this video so I can say whatever I want. So um I don't know. Challenge your beliefs is what I would say. There's no evidence that is within the last 25 years that supports that. It was hypothesized it might be true. And the leptin myth was specifically, so leptin is a hormone. It's kind of considered to be like the regulator of your body's metabolism. As you diet, your leptin levels will drop down. So that's one of the reasons why your metabolism slows that and thyroid as well are all interrelated. Um, and so it was thought that a, um, refeed or a high day or a cheat meal or some kind of a carb cycle, having those higher intake days would spike your leptin and rev your metabolism back up. And guess what? That is true. That is what happens. So there, there is some basis for this. The problem is the practical effect of it. And this is where you always, always get screwed when it comes to watching my videos here is because there's the science, there's the bro aspect of it, but then there's also like, okay, yeah, but how does it actually work in practice? And that's what I try to bring to the table here. And how it works in practice is yes, a high carb day does spike your leptin for a very short amount of time. And then like in less than a day, it's back down to where it was before. So you get effectively no boost out of it at all. Like the effort that you put into planning it required enough um, glycogen in your brain that you probably burn through the excess that your body would have burned uh, having had your leptin restored to normal levels for five hours, realistically. So it's just not worth it. It doesn't do anything. It's not this magic secret to fat loss. There is no stoking of the metabolism that happens in any reasonable way. It's kind of like, you know, if you want to burn a fire, do you put another log on it? and then wait and tend to it and stoke it and really kind of nurture it and get that log in a position where it's it's getting the embers on it, it's getting all the heat, et cetera. Or do you just throw some dry leaves on it and it's like, who burns, yay. And then five seconds later, it's done burning. Like that's what a high carb day does. Having a good healthy metabolism, more muscle on your frame, et cetera, that's putting an extra log on the fire, but you have to do that beforehand. So it's about building the fire before you set it ablaze. Um, that's the proper way to do it. Throwing dry leaves on it doesn't do anything. You know, it creates a spark. It make, it brightens up everything and it gives you heat for five seconds. It, it's meaningless in the long term. So um, there's no magical bullshit being performed under the hood. And in that way, in that respect, it's much like intermittent fasting um, because it's the same thing. Like everybody's like intermittent fasting worked for me. And the answer here universally, because there is nothing magical about intermittent fasting either. And if I am starting to get louder here, it's just because I'm so sick of this stupid myth that won't die about intermittent fasting being some magical thing. It's like, you know what's magical about it? It's that you did it and it worked for you because you just did something. If you do intermittent fasting or if you follow a standard meal plan, if you follow both of those that are constructed the same way with the same parameters, you get the same result, exact same result, doesn't matter. You might actually get a better result from the meal plan depending on how you execute the rest of your day built around your fasting schedule. So um, yeah, yeah. Let's please just kick some of this bullshit to the curb and stop it. So carb cycling, like there can be a utility for it. Don't tell me that it's why you got lean unless the reason it worked for you is because it just helped create a plan that was more sustainable. And therefore you felt like, you know, you're doing a better job of adhering to it. And you felt like your quality of life was a little bit easier. I did carb cycle all through my recent prep. Um, I didn't have any high days. I kicked those to the curb after a few weeks just because I realized I didn't need them and they weren't really doing anything for me other than giving me something to look forward to. But you know what I look forward to more? Um, faster results. So, yeah. Um, and again, like embracing the extremes, if you want to have a high day, great, but that's got to come from somewhere else. Um, there was a video that um, Mike Israel did, Renaissance Periodization, where um, he worked out the math. And this is also correct, um, where... 
you know, if you if you have some days where you're actually at a surplus, and then you have most days where you're at a deficit, um, the ratio you can pair those at a ratio and still be like as long as your deficit is stronger, like you're at like a I think the example that he used was a 750 calorie deficit and a 250 calorie surplus. Well, if you have those even at like a two to one ratio, then you're um, you're still like a six to one deficit to, um, to surplus ratio as far as your, as far as, um, how deep of a deficit you're in. So, um, it does work. Um, the problem is like a deficit that sharp gets harder and harder for people to adhere to. Um, because, and also like, this is all great in a perfect world, but you can't really know if you're in a 750 calorie deficit. Like you can specify a range, like I'm probably in this much of a deficit, but trying to pretend like we have the exact numbers here is just a fallacy. That's not really how the human body works. You know, you're not a T1000 that has an overlay on your screen that tells you what your metabolic rate is. Like you can plug all that, all your particulars into a calculator and it will tell you what it is. It's wrong. So um, we can't really rely on that data. So we have to make some assumptions here. So. When it starts getting a little too mathy, that's when I'm like, mm, the practical police are showing up and it's a little hard to really like stay on top of this and and know for sure that what you're doing is really accurate. Conceptually, yeah. So basically a sharper deficit, let's say you do like four days at a deficit, you do one day at a moderate surplus. Cool. You still have to run the math and say like, where are my calories averaging out over the course of those five days? Um, how does that compare to if I was just on plan all days with a less aggressive deficit? Um, you know, is it beneficial to have that one higher day thrown in? Do I get anything out of that? I made the determination for me that it was not. It was just easier for me from a planning perspective, from a mental expectations perspective, um, and from a perspective also of like reducing food fixation as well to just say like, these are my normal days and then I'm going to cycle down lower on my rest days because I can handle that. You know, I'm going to take the extra gym time and just take a longer nap during the middle of the day, something like that. Um, and just focus on steps and cardio, keep my deficit in line. There we go. And I was able to push that um, deficit on low days a little bit more aggressive as well. And they got, it got a little dicey there towards the end, but it felt manageable as well. Like I felt like I could have taken, taken it down leaner and tighter if I needed to, um, but ran out of time. So anyway, point being for carb cycling to bring it back to reality, um, there's no magical bullshit happening here. None of that. So get that out of your head. So other situations here, if you're in a growth phase, um, carb cycling to um, lower targets on your rest days, it can, you know, like we talked about before, can help your digestive system kind of get a little bit of a break. Um, you can pull that carb target back into a more comfortable place where you're not like pushing intake at really aggressive levels that starts to feel unmanageable and unsustainable. Um, just make note of what your weekly carb total is. So still like, we still want to know what that number is because that's the number that matters. If you're in a growth phase where you're still like very diligent tracking things and eating to spec and following a plan, monitoring your weekly carb total, uh, assuming that carbs are the only things that are changing here, um, is good. So you can look at your rate of um, gain for a week, compare that to your weekly carb total, rate of gain for four consecutive weeks, compare that to your average weekly carb total, or just how that scales over time if it does, and make decisions based on that. So um, be consistent with your training schedule or at least your training frequency. So if you're training six days one week and you're training four days the next week, if you've got a big swing between your training days and non-training days, that can have a pretty big impact on your um, weekly carb intake if you're doing a cycle. And it just it, it's one more variable in a, a series of data points. And the fewer variables you can have, the easier it's going to be to arrive at what the real answer and solution is. So calorie cycling. So this is like where we cycle calories instead of carbs. There are some downsides to this. Um, it's still a little bit more complicated. It's a little bit more to keep track of um, because first of all, we want to keep your protein up over a certain threshold, right? There's a minimum level of protein, like one gram per pound of body weight. We don't want to drop that under. So our ability to cycle down on protein um, is a little limited. And also if you start doing that, like, okay, well, my protein is at 1.3 grams per pound. I'm going to cycle down to one gram per pound of body weight on this day. Well, that just, you know, how, how do you translate that to all of your meals? Because they should all get small little jumps down um, versus like, I'm just going to take it all from this meal. And so now I've got a, a meal with eight grams of protein. It's like, yeah, we want to avoid that. So I think making that work in a way that is um, intellectually honest and good is just a little bit more work, kind of a pain in the ass. Um, why not just do fats instead? So um, you could, uh, you certainly could. Um, but again, it's like, What's going to have the most uh, 
obvious impact. Like what we're trying to do here is is sustain performance, right? And also like keep your appetite so that it's a, a little bit more on the up and up and, and manageable. And so carbs um, will have the biggest impact on your appetite, um, at least compared to fats. I mean, protein will as well. Um, but especially if you have like higher volume carbs, you pull those down or if you have you know, if you're, if you're comfortable with your intake level on, you know, mediocre, um, quality carbs, but then on your low days, you're like, I'm going to go for high volume carbs here. I'm going to do a lot of veggie. I'm going to do a lot of cauliflower rice. You could find yourself actually feeling more full on your lower carb days. That's certainly a possibility. Um, so for somebody that doesn't have a super strong appetite, but they have one that's present and they want some variety, you can actually have a fairly different plan on your non-training day versus your training day. Um, and just swap out all of your carb sources for like higher volume ones, something like that. And at that point you could, be more aggressive in how you handle it. You could um, absolutely um, uh, drop that number, that carb target on your non-training days down quite low. But in that, in that situation, for somebody that isn't necessarily super food fixated, for somebody that doesn't have a super strong appetite, I don't know that I would carb cycle them at all because it's a sustainability tactic and they probably already find the diet pretty sustainable as it's written. So why overcomplicate it? You know, um, you could also consider what I'd call anchor macros where, um, you have your protein fixed, you have your calorie target fixed, and then you can just modulate your carbs and fats as desired and let the chips fall where they may. So it's basically there, there's an interplay between these things where if you know your proteins, your carbs, and your fats, then you know your calories. Um, and so we want our protein always in the same range. Uh, and I won't bother to give you numerical examples here just because I'd be doing the math off the top of my head and it'd be a travesty. Uh, but you could have like a certain number of carbs and a certain number of fats and then bring one down as the other comes up. And when you find that correct ratio, it's like two and a quarter to one. Um, you drop down carbs, um, you know, let's say, let's not, let's just forget it. <laughs> forget the math involved, basically. Like, yeah, you, you could just play around with those two. It doesn't really make that big of a difference. And if you, especially if you don't have a super strong appetite, if you go super high fats and super low carbs, Eh, you know, that's fine. You know, it, it's not a big deal. It's it's going to yield you the same outcome in terms of fat loss. You may feel a difference in performance, but maybe not. So when fat cycling, this is going to be most appropriate if you have a keto or a carnivore diet where you just don't have any carbs and therefore there's no carb cycling to do if you still want to cycle your intake. I don't, I don't find it's as effective just because um, carbs have a much more direct impact on your performance because they are just you know directly converted to glucose. Everything else has a slower process to go through. So the impact isn't felt quite as acutely if you do like, oh, I'm doing this is my high fat day. Okay, cool. Or is my low fat day. You know, you're not really going to feel that. It doesn't have as much of an impact on the appetite. I just don't find it to be quite as impactful overall. So um, less valuable in that way. Fats aren't super satiating, so having more or less of them doesn't impact what we're really looking to do, which is uh, have an impact on sustainability. So um, less of a direct impact on performance as well. So if you have a 40 gram um, swing on carbs, that's pretty substantial, you know, um, in terms of like, you know, the, the calorie swing that that would have and also like the, the food volume that could come along with that as well. Um, but if we we're going to do the same calorie equivalency here um, with a fat cycle, it'd be 17 grams. So it's, it's just not going to be quite as impactful. Like what can that bring in for you? You know, a couple tablespoons of peanut butter might be worth it. So I don't know. It just depends. It just depends. That's a very situational thing. It's going to be a different answer for everybody. Not something that I typically would recommend though. So what, what do I recommend? So as with most things here, it's going to be based on need. And so I will usually introduce a carb cycle at the start of a deficit phase, unless I know it's somebody that really just doesn't have a strong appetite. If we've been working in growth maintenance for a while, we've done a mini cut, et cetera. And then we're like, okay, cool. Here's our first real deficit phase. Like I've got a good idea of where they're at. And if it's somebody that's not particularly particularly food motivated, I'm going to say like, all right, I'm just doing a straight cut here. No big deal. And then they'll often ask like, when are we going to carb cycle when we need to? So you tell me like, that's the answer that I'm going to be waiting for on that. Um, but I'll usually start one, um, for most people when we begin a deficit, it just, it keeps your overall, um, your average daily intake higher. Um, and also like it, the low day can be kind of a suck day for a lot of people. And I kind of like bringing that in. I mean, this isn't really me being a sadist. Like I kind of like this for myself as well. Having a day early in prep that just kind of sucks. It, it really makes it feel a lot more real, a lot more significant. And it can really be a big mental shift. Like you get that day early in prep where you're like, wow, okay, I'm hungry. 
I haven't been hungry in a while. This is kind of kind of weird, kind of neat, right? So especially if you've been in a prolonged growth phase, like I want to have a day where you're feeling it like really, really quick um, just because it immediately signals to you like, oh, shit just got real. Okay. So I think there's value in it there, like playing the mental game a little bit. Um, and I would say if, if somebody has a semi-erratic lifting schedule where they, they are possible to you know miss a lift, um, you'd want to do all of your carbs that you're removing or adding in your pre and post meal to help plan that out better. The main thing I would say is to have your expectations in line. And again, for the thousandth time on this episode, um, it is not a fat loss strategy. That is not what carb cycling does. I hope I have done a decent job of disproving that. So um, think about how this works for you and how you might implement this or not in your next fat loss phase, however. So we will be back for 268 next week. I do thank you all for joining me and I will see you then.